Good afternoon, Year 10s. Nice to see you all. I hope you're staying safe and well. Uh, this is now part two of uh, Act 4, Scene 1 uh, of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Last lesson, we looked at the opening of the scene in which the witches gather around a, a boiling cauldron. They chant double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. And we know that they're meeting in a, you know, the pit of Acheron. So they're meeting in, they're meeting in hell. Uh, they've come to meet with Macbeth, who is going to ask them to explain their predictions in more detail. They, In the scene that we saw last, they're creating this demonic potion, and we looked at the bizarre, macabre and sinister ingredients that they add to this uh, boiling broth, which is later described as a hell broth, appropriately, because again, they are creating something that is associated with hell, associated with the devil itself. Um, and it's also, you know, there were, we talked about the different ingredients being, you know, reptiles, mammals that can fly, mammal, uh, cold-blooded creatures, amphibians, humans that are non-Christian and, and their body organs and mythical creatures. It's a bizarre, uh, you know, uh, a bizarre um, medley of ingredients that have been included in this in this broth. So in today's lesson, we're looking at Macbeth's entrance and what what is now known as the apparition scene. Uh, an apparition is a vision or an illusion or a hallucination. We know that Macbeth has experienced two significant hallucinations so far in the play. The first was the dagger that led him to Duncan's chamber. The second was Banquo's ghost that interrupted the feast uh, and caused him to reveal in front of all of his no nobles and his lords that he is mentally unstable, that he has uh, this strange fit, as Lady Macbeth put it. And then we're about to see a series of apparitions. There are actually uh, quite a few in a row that we see, and they all have a very, very important symbolic meaning. Uh, he's going to drink a potion, and then you'll, he'll see these uh, apparitions appear before him. And they, each of them are each of them is incredibly important symbolically. This lesson might end up being a bit longer than the average lesson because it's such a rich scene. And I do want to get to the end of Act Four in this sorry Act Four Scene One in this lesson. Um, what I'm going to start off by doing is just reminding you and showing you again the summary of this scene, just so you know exactly what's going on in this scene. And then we're going to have a look at uh, the apparition scene. See you soon. OK, well, once again, I'm just going to give you some time to read through the summary of this scene so you won't hear my voice again for about 30 seconds or so. Okay, as always, I'm going to read this scene in chunks um, and do a close reading after each after each initial reading of that segment of the scene. So we'll start by reading from Enter Macbeth up until the third apparition, which is quite a long scene. So it's actually up until uh, it's actually a whole page and a bit of my of my edition, uh, and then we'll read from that third apparition to the end of the scene. So hopefully, just two chunks. Uh, is how we're going to do this. So I'll, I'll read along. I won't tell you each, each time I change character, but we'll read through it. Like I said, it's always useful if you've already read the scene before we actually do a, before we read it as a class. Okay, so I'm going from Enter Macbeth. How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is it you do? A deed without a name. I conjure you by that which you profess, however you come to know it. Answer me. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, though the yesterday waves confound and swallow navigation up, Though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, though castles topple on their warders' heads, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads up to their foundations, though the treasure of nature's germans tumble altogether, even till destruction sicken, answer me to what I ask you. Speak, demand, we'll answer. Say if thou'd rather hear it from us or from our masters. Call him, let me see him. Pour in sow's blood that hath eaten her nine pharaoh. Grease that sweaten from the murderer's gibbet, thrown into the flame. Come high or low, thyself an office deftly show. Thunder, first apparition, an armed head. Tell me, thou unknown's power, he knows thy thoughts. Hear his speech, but say thou naught. 
Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware, Macduff, beware the Thane of Fife. Dismiss me, enough. Descends. Macbeth, whatever thou art, for thy good caution thanks. Thou hast harped my fear aright, but one word more. He will not be commanded. Here's another, more potent than the last. Than the first, sorry. Thunder. Second apparition, a bloody child. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Had I three ears, I'd hear more. Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Then live, Macduff. What need I fear of thee? But just I'll make assurance doubly sure, and take a bond of fate. Thou shalt not live, that I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies, and sleep in spite of thunder. Thir thunder, third apparition of a child crowned with a tree in his hand. What is this that rises like the issue of a king, and wears upon his baby brow the round and top of sovereignty? <laughs> Listen, but speak not to it. Be lion metal, proud, and take no care, who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquish be, until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. Descends. Okay, that's where we'll read up to uh, today. Let's go back and look at the scene in more detail. Okay, on your screens you have an artist's interpretation of this scene. As you can see, Mac Macbeth is entering into the witch's lair, uh, which we've talked about being hell on earth, hell on earth in a sense. Uh, they've met by the, you know, by the Acheron River, uh, and he's commanding them to show him these apparitions. And the apparitions are hugely important. It's worth bearing in mind what happened in a previous scene. Remember, Hecate says that she will take charge of Macbeth's uh, torture. And she intends to mislead him. Remember, she, she, she intends for these apparitions to trick him into thinking that he's immortal, into thinking that he can defy fate, into thinking that he has no threats of rebellion. So these, it's really important that you are aware that when Macbeth watches and, and perceives these apparitions, he misinterprets them, he misunderstands them, he takes them for good omens when in fact we know that they're not. So this, the, the entire scene works because of Shakespeare's use of dramatic irony. Had we not seen, had we not watched the scene with Hecat instructing the witches to fool Macbeth into thinking that he was immortal, into thinking that he could defy fate, into thinking that his reign was safe, this scene wouldn't make as much sense. In fact, it wouldn't make any sense. Uh, the whole point of the scene is that Macbeth is, is falsely convinced that he is taking charge of the witches. He's falsely convinced that the witches are aiding him and helping him. And he's falsely convinced by the end of this scene, I'll just remind it to be quite heavy handed, he's falsely convinced that he is immortal, that he can't be killed. He's convinced that no one will rebel against him. And he's convinced uh, that the fates are uh, on his side. So it's hugely important that you remember the dramatic irony here. Macbeth is being tricked and misled by the witches uh, in this scene. Okay, I think it's really interesting the dynamic between the witches and Macbeth. Macbeth entering without any kind of welcome, without any, without, you know, any pretenses or any preamble, immediately launches into demanding the witches to speak to him. How now, you secret, black, midnight hags, what is it you do? What, so what are you doing, essentially, is what he asks them straight away. You can sense in the tone, the anger, the, um, the, the fear, and the uh, sense of kind of distrust that emanates from Macbeth. It's significant that he uses these this lists of adjectives. They, they are secretive, they're black, and they're midnight. All of these associations, of course, are with kind of mythical creatures or predatory animals. Uh, they're black, they're midnight, uh, they're secret. Uh, and he's kind of emphasizing their association with darkness, uh, with the night, uh, and with the supernatural. He also genders, you know, gives them places more emphasis on their gender than he had, has previously. These women are hags; they're old crones. Uh, they are certainly gendered. They're old, old, withered ladies, and it kind of reminds us of Banquo's line from Act One, Scene Three, where he describes them as withered hags, withered and wild in their attire. And what's fascinating about this scene is how often the witches will speak in unison again we've talked about why this is it gives it a sense of eeriness a sense of being sinister a sense of you know an idea that they can read each other's thoughts and they reply at once a deed without a name so a, 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 an act that can't even be described and i think we we as an audience might think back to how macbeth fails to describe 
the act that he committed that has no name, which is regicide. So perhaps already they're reminding him of the dark act that he's committed himself. Then we have this dialogue from Macbeth. It's a, it's a very you know, loaded piece of dialogue. It's loaded with imagery. It's loaded with uh, metaphor. He conjures them. He commands them, essentially. And it's interesting the tone he's taking. I would say, we'll come back to that in a second, but it's, it's interesting the tone of voice that he's taking with these witches. He says, I command you, uh, in the name of whatever you are doing, uh, you need to answer me. Okay? So he's commanding answers from them. And we've talked about this before. It's an example of, of Macbeth's hubris, his arrogance, his pride. Of course, we as an audience know that he's actually walking into a trap. He's a fly flying into a spider's web here. We know that the witches are now bent on uh, giving him false information, on misleading him. He has no idea what he's let himself in for, in a sense. So, it's significant that he takes on this commanding and authoritative tone as though he were the more powerful. And of course, he may be king of Scotland, but he's still powerless compared to the might of these supernatural creatures. But he doesn't realise it. Uh, I'll, I'll write down that key term again. It's dramatic irony. Remember that scene with Hecat. We as an audience know that Macbeth is being lured into a trap here, that they're going to trick him. Okay. However, he does show some semblance of a realisation that he is in the, he's walking into the lair of creatures that are powerful to some extent. He says, although you can do a number of things, and he lists the things, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but he lists the things that the witches can do, okay? What he says here is, though you can untie the wind and let them fight against the churches. So though you can, again, this is about how witches can control the weather, right? And that they can, batter, and that, that the, the winds can batter down churches, yeah? Notice how, again, they're on the side, of, the which is on the side of darkness or of the devil, because they're tearing down holy buildings, which is you know, the house of churches are the house of God. Though you can, with yesty waves, confound and swallow navigation up. Again, this metaphor represents the idea that they can raise storms. The yesty, yes, yeast is what makes bread rise. So what they're saying is these these waves are yesty and foamy, and they're rising and they're and they're swallowing up navigation. That's a ship. So th let's just recap quickly. Though you can control the weather and break down churches, though you can raise storms and raise waves and uh, sink ships and sailors, though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, that's slightly more tricky, especially the corn being lodged. What he means by that is that you, that you can, you can uh, fell, you can chop down uh, fields of corn. And again, that, that might link to how the witches can cause starvation. Uh, so you, you can destroy crops, you can destroy fields of corn, and you can, I mean, this is more of this, you can, you can blow trees down, okay? So he's, let's just be really clear, and just before we turn the page, just make sure we've got this uh, completely. He's acknowledging, he is acknowledging that the witches are, are powerful in many ways. Even though we know that he's, I, I've just said that he's trying to be commanding, he is acknowledging their power here, isn't he? Okay, he continues. He continues, though castles topple on their warders' heads, so they, though they have the power to, uh, to make castles collapse, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations. So again, they have, the, they have the power to destroy pyramids, castles and palaces. All of these are sites of power and, and all these are buildings associated with kingship, monarchy and the divine right of kings. Though the treasures of nature's Germans tumble altogether. This is, this is the most important one, okay, I think. Because what he means by this is though you have the power to tumble nature's Germans together, so though you have the power to create natural disorder uh, or be, to create or to destroy the natural chain of being, that's what he means. Uh, that's what nature Germans means metaphorically. So though you have the power to destroy nature's creation and destroy nature's order, even, even until you make destruction itself sick, so it's a bit of an example of hyperbole here, even though you can mix things up to such an extent that even destruction itself gets queasy. Um, answer me to what I ask you. And interesting, we've talked about this already, but it's another example of Macbeth's hubris. He, he delivers an imperative towards the witches. He gives them the command, uh, again, falsely believing that he has any power that he, can observe, that he can exert over them. We know that he's powerless in comparison. Okay, so that's what he means. He's saying, though you can do all of these things, you're going to answer me. So he's, he's acknowledging to some extent their power, but equally he is 
he's not compromising here. He's being very combative. He wants them to answer his questions. The witches respond, speak, demand, will answer. And it's, fa and it's you know, again, we've talked a lot throughout the play about the number three and the, how it's associated with the devil and how frequently the witches will either speak in threes themselves, they'll list, they'll list in threes, or they'll speak all three at the same time. Uh, and that's deliberately done to emphasize the satanic nature of the witches. The witches say, speak, demand, will answer. So sure, we'll answer your questions. And she asks, the first witch asks, would you rather it came from us or from our masters? And presumably she means from her demonic masters. And Macbeth says, call them, let me see them. And again, notice the imperatives. Uh, call, let me see them. And then we have this gruesome image, um, which some of us may have struggled with initially. She says, pour in Sal's blood that have eaten her nine pharaoh, grease that sweating from the murderer's gibbet thrown into the flame. Uh, and then they speak in unison, come high or low, thyself and office deftly show. And we're going to have to have a checkpoint here, but I want to go over this bit here. And I'll show you an image to explain what I mean. So we talked last lesson, and here's the image for it, about the ingredients that the witches include in this concoction that they've produced. And we talked about how it's a, it's a mixture of supernatural creatures, of reptiles that are cold-blooded or toxic and venomous, of predators, of exotic animals, and then most disturbingly of all, of human body parts. And we talked about the liver of the Jew, the Turk's nose, the Tartar's lips, and possibly most shocking of all, the, the finger of the uh, baby that's birth strangled. Um, and now we have an, another addition that they're adding. So it's as if it's a, it's a, it's as if it's a work in progress, this, this, this broth. And they add in Sal's blood, and I'll put a picture of that on the board. Okay, and this moment might not seem that important, but if, if it's, it's worth reading carefully, on your picture you have a picture of a sow and, and, and her piglets. Uh, but the sow's blood that they choose to pour into the cauldron is a sow that has committed well, a, a terrible deed, uh, just like Macbeth, I suppose. But it's committed the act of eating its own babies. It's, it's, it's eaten its nine pharaohs, so it's eaten its nine piglets. And again, it's the second time or third time that cannibalism has been referenced to. This idea that... Again, this is a, a hellish broth because there are cannibals, there are non-Christians, there are animals that are related to the supernatural, there are venomous animals. And so they added that ingredient, this, the sow's blood. And again, it's a horrifying image. And you can imagine as a, as a prop the dramatic effects that, that it would have on the audience, seeing the witch pour in the blood to this, into this car. And the second ingredient that they mention is perhaps even more disturbing. You've got an image uh, like uh, from the Jacobean period on, on, on your screens here. This is a public hanging. And what the witches now add is the sweat uh, or the greasy sweat that's been taken from a murderer's body. Uh, it's a really grim and macabre image. Uh, and they've added that into the fires of hell. And of course, you know, the murderer who, who's hung uh, would be... Uh, uh, boiling and burning in the fires of hell as well. So it's another image that relates to this hellish imagery that's that's permeated throughout this passage. Okay, we then have here the summoning of the evil spirits, and they summon spirits that are high or low, so spirits that are mighty or mighty or not so mighty, uh, to show themselves and to show their uh, to show their secrets, I suppose, to show their powers. Uh, and then we have thunder and. We'll, have, we'll look at these apparitions in the next part of the lesson. However, you can no see that I've got my checkpoint marks here, so I'd like you to use this as a checkpoint to summarise the scene so far. Um, and I would suggest that will take you 10 to 15 minutes. So take your time, collect your thoughts, read through your notes, read through the scene again, uh, and please pause the video now, and I'll see you soon. OK, welcome back here, Tim. We've come to the iconic apparition scene. Uh, where Macbeth has he's drunk from this charm, remember it's full of these strange and bizarre ingredients, and he's experiencing these hallucinations as a result of the powers of these spirits. It's incredibly important to remember that these hallucinations, these visions he's about to see, uh, have more than one meaning, that they're designed to trick him into thinking that he is immortal, into tricking him to think that his reign is stable, into tricking him into believing that he can defy fate. So it's all about essentially uh, making Macbeth believe that he's invulnerable to attack and to being usurped. So we're going to look at each of these apparitions in turn. Most of the time you actually have images from the text. I'm not going to go uh, over to, I'm not going to be annotating my text so much now, but I will be verbally explaining to you 
uh, each apparition. So there are three. In fact, that's wrong. My mistake, there are four. Uh, so I'll go over those four apparitions and we'll have a checkpoint after uh, we've seen the fourth apparition. Okay, so we'll see one, two, three, and then four apparitions, and then we'll have a checkpoint. Let's have a look at the first apparition. Okay, so the first of the apparitions is an armed head or an armoured head. And on your screen, you can see this head. It's a, it's a, it's a head that's been severed, so cut off, uh, and it's wearing armour. It's incredibly important to remember that these apparitions are all deeply, deeply symbolic. So make sure you've got symbolism in your notes. These represent ideas. And it's very important, again, to reiterate that they have double meanings. They have the meaning that Macbeth attaches to them, and then they have the meaning that we as an audience know that they might have. Uh, remember, they're designed to trick Macbeth. So the first apparition is an armed head. And the apparition, uh, we're told by the witches, uh, can read Macbeth's thoughts. It says, he knows thy thoughts. Because Macbeth tries to speak to it, there's a dash. It says, tell me thou unknown power, dash. And then the first which is, he knows thy thoughts, so you don't need to say them. So it's important that the, these apparitions are spirits that can read his thoughts. And the apparition says, Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware, Macduff, beware the Thane of Fife, dismiss me enough. And then he descends. These words are incredibly significant because they give Macbeth false hope. He says, beware the Thane of Duff, uh, beware the Thane of Fife, beware Macduff, dismiss me enough. So, and it's really important that Macbeth misinterprets this symbol. He misunderstands it. His response is, thanks for the good caution. I'm just reading at the lines if you've got your text out in front of you. He says, for thy good caution, thanks. You've harped my fear aright, but one more word. And he tries to ask it more questions, but the, the, the apparition disappears. Really important to remember, but Macbeth has misunderstood the meaning of this apparition. He thinks it represents the severed head of Macduff, who he is plotting on having killed. It's very important you understand that. He, he thinks it represents Macduff's severed head. It does not. He is wrong. The witches are trying to trick him. The head itself, and make sure you've got this in your notes, please. The head itself represents his own severed head. Okay, and I'll, I'll say a word on that. The se severed heads at this point in history are obviously used in battle or after battle or after an execution of a tyrant as a way of quickly you know, spreading the word about the death of a, of a tyrant or of a traitor. We've saw, we saw that, that the Thane of Corda was beheaded earlier. We saw that MacDonald was beheaded earlier and called a traitor. Uh, that's the consequence of treachery. So it's important that the severed head represents betrayal, represents disloyalty, represents treachery. Um, this is the time before newspapers. So by showing a severed head, by, show it, by holding up aloft the severed head of a tyrant, you are, in effect sending a viral tweet into the into the world by by showing the visual evidence that the king is dead the tyrant is dead so macbeth has misunderstood this this uh, apparition actually represents his own severed head and it's an example of foreshadowing his head will be severed from his body in act five macduff will hold aloft macbeth's severed head and declare that tyranny in scotland is over so it's a very, very loaded image. It has multiple meanings, but we need to remember as an audience, because of that scene earlier with Hecat, we know that the witches are tricking Macbeth and that this head does not belong to Macduff. It belongs to Macbeth and it's a symbol of, uh, of tyranny being, uh, being ended. And actually it's his own head that he's seeing. So when, it, when the apparition says, beware Macduff, we know that the apparition is misleading Macbeth. Um, when it says, beware the thing of Fife, it's, it's, a bit like those, we talked about in a previous lesson, it's a bit like the Delphic Oracle from, from Greek myth uh, and from Greek culture. The Delphic Oracle often would give uh, prophecies or advice that was deliberately vague and ambiguous and deliberately could be misunderstood. And Macbeth has misunderstood this. And just to reiterate, his reaction is fascinating because it's clearly given him false hope. He says, I was, I was fearful of him already and I was going to deal with him already. So false hope has been given. Okay, I think it's well worth taking a checkpoint. I know that was actually just a brief, uh, a brief moment, but I think it's really worth taking it some time because I don't want you to be confused about the different apparitions and what they represent. So please, can you take some time now to to to, to 
explain to me your understanding of the first apparition, maybe a short paragraph or two of writing uh, explaining the significance of that first apparition. So please pause the video and I'll see you in five to ten minutes. Okay, here we have the second apparition. Um, again, I've, you need to have your copies of, of the play before you or near you so you can keep coming back and forth from the video to the copy of the play. So the second apparition is a bloody child pictured for you here, a baby, a, a baby covered in blood. Uh, presumably a baby that's just been born. That's I think that's the supposed meaning. Not a, not a child that's been hurt or killed, but I think a child that's just been newly born. So obviously when a child uh, is born, it's come, kind of covered in, in blood and mucus from, from, from its time in the womb. The second apparition says to Macbeth again, Macbeth, 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 be bloody, bold and resolute, laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth, and then it descends. And we're going to do it in two parts. We're going to talk about what the apparition actually says, what it represents, and then we're going to talk about Macbeth's reaction. So in terms of what the apparition actually represents, again, remember these, it's almost, I would actually think back to that coin that I showed you at the beginning of the series about the gunpowder plot, and it was the snake and the flower. And just like a coin that has two sides, two, you know, two different sides with two different things on it, so too do these apparitions. They have two different meanings. One meaning is intended to trick Macbeth, the other one is the real meaning. So this child, this child covered in blood, I would assume Macbeth interprets this as representing his own child and the fact that he will pass on the crown to his own offspring. So to put it succinctly and bluntly, I would interpret this child as representing uh, Macbeth's primogeniture, the idea of passing on the crown to his, uh, to his firstborn son. You could also argue that this, this baby is supposed to, in Macbeth's opinion, it's supposed to represent immortality. Okay, the bloody child might represent immortality. Let's now look at what it says and what this and what what, what it means. He says, "Be violent, be courageous, and be firm. Laugh at the power of men, for none of women born to harm Macbeth." So this apparition is clearly emphasizing the idea that um, that uh, j just like the last apparition the last apparition said beware the thane of fife macduff and remember that macbeth misunderstood that he thought it meant that he should kill macduff but actually what it means is that macduff will kill you at the end of the play similarly this apparition is saying make sure you're bloody make sure you're violent make sure you're courageous make sure you're firm make sure that you laugh at the power of other men so make sure that you you, you consider yourselves to be more powerful than other men uh, for none of women born can harm macbeth so macbeth understandably misunderstands this as meaning he is immortal almost like achilles in greek myth and how achilles is dipped in uh in this magical potion to make him immortal to other men it macbeth misinterprets the meaning no one of woman born can harm macbeth well clearly that riddle in macbeth's mind means that no one can kill him no matter because obviously all of us are born of women, all, all humans are. So he mis misunderstands this and thinks that this means that no one can kill him. So again, he thinks that he's immortal. Let's now consider what it actually means. And I'm going to kind of, again, spoil the play for you a little bit if you've not seen it already. What it actually refers to is in Act 5, when Mac Macduff and Macbeth have that duel, Macduff reveals to Macbeth that he was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. And what he means by that is he was delivered by caesarean operation. So his, he was taken out of his mother's womb by caesarean, which is not t technically the same thing as being born of a woman because he wasn't, you know, born naturally, I suppose. It's a bit of a cop out, I, 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 would, I would say. But the, the point is that that's the actual meaning that Macduff is technically the, woman, the person who's not of woman born. So once again, that's now two apparitions in a row that actually refer to how Macbeth will be killed by Macduff, but can also be interpreted and have been interpreted by Macbeth as meaning that he's invulnerable, that he that he is uh, that he will he cannot be usurped. So notice the double meaning there. And then, like the other apparition, this apparition descends and disappears. Now, before we do a checkpoint, let's consider Macbeth's reaction to this apparition. Macbeth says, "Then live, Macduff." What need I fear of thee? And that rhetorical question obviously implies that he believes these apparitions and he's again misunderstood them. He thinks, well, that means I don't need to be afraid of Macbeth, uh, of Macduff rather. And he says, I'll make assurance doubly sure and take a bond of fate. Thou shalt not live. 
that I may tell pale heart of fear, lies and sleep in spice of thunder. What he means by that metaphorically is that he now will make sure that the apparition is true by having Macduff murdered. And in the next scene, uh, he lays he lays siege to Macbeth's to Macduff's castle. So I keep saying the word the word Macduff instead of Macbeth. What I mean is that he will he will in the next scene attack Macduff's castle and kill his wife and son and servants, um, to, to make sure that Macduff cannot usurp the throne from him. So to make sure that he can't be deposed by Macduff. But let's remember, just be really clear. Obviously, he's wrong, and we know as an audience, again, it's dramatic irony. We know that the witches are actually intent on tricking him. And then the apparition descends. Okay, let's take some time now, again, to have a checkpoint. I'd like you to summarise your understanding of that second apparition. So please take your time, read through your notes, read through the scene again, and write a short couple of paragraphs summarising your understanding of the second apparition, a bloody child. So please now pause the video. Welcome back. On your screen, you have an artist's interpretation of the third apparition, which arrives with more thunder. Notice the pathetic fallacy running throughout the scene. Um, and this third apparition is described as a child crowned with a tree in his hand. So once again, I'm talking about I'm going to talk about the how the how the apparition is interpreted by Macbeth, how it ought to be interpreted and its symbolic meaning, and then what it actually says. So how is it interpreted by Macbeth? But by Macbeth is important. Macbeth interprets this as meaning. Uh, this he, he completely misinterprets this, and I'll, I'll, I'll go over it, how he does it in a second. Let's actually talk about the meaning symbolically. Uh, the meaning symbolically, it, this child with a tree in its hand, it represents um, primogeniture, the idea of the first ch child uh, being the inheritor of the crown. It also represents the idea of forming a dynasty. So the tree represents the royal family tree. So this is that's what the uh, apparition is supposed to represent and I think most of the audience would understand this as being a fairly obvious symbol of dynasty and I'll remind you of the key moment in the play uh, where dynasty comes up as a, an important idea that's haunted Macbeth ever since. He compares himself earlier in the play to Mark Antony who was the final, uh, not Mark, yeah Mark Antony who was the final uh, kind of leader during the Roman Republic. He was part of the triumvirate. And Mark Anthony is deposed and replaced by Octavius Caesar, who becomes Emperor Augustus, who founds an empire. So this apparition, we, we interpret it as being representing a, a dynasty, a line of kings, and crucially, remember this play is written uh, to flatter King James I, crucially this symbol is an example of flattery because James I of, is of course a descendant of Banquo and you could argue that the tree represents the Stuart family's dynasty, the great line of kings that would be the Stuart family. So it's an example of flattery. However, Macbeth completely misinterprets it. What's interesting about the scene is that he actually questions this, this apparition because it's not like the other two. He says, what is this that rises like the issue of a king and wears upon his baby brow the round and top of sovereignty? So he basically says, what is this thing that arises uh, in the form of a king, in the form of sovereignty, but actually um, wearing it, but, but, but baby faced? And the witches silence him, say, listen, but don't speak to it. And here's what the third apparition says. It says, be lion metalled proud and take no care who chafes, who frets or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquish be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsnane Hill shall come against him. Okay, so the let us go over what the what the apparition actually says. So the apparition tells Macbeth to act to be as courageous as a lion, obviously, lion metalled, be proud. Do not worry, it says, about who hates you, who's arguing you, arguing with you, or who is conspiring against you. So he's essentially saying, don't worry about your enemies. Remember that these apparitions are designed to trick Macbeth. So he's being told, don't worry about being usurped. Don't worry about being uh, deposed. Your enemies are no harm to you. Uh, but then it, then there's a caveat. The caveat. It says, until Great Burnham Wood to High Dunstanane Hill shall come against him. So the apparition says, you're, you're untouchable. You're invulnerable. You are... Uh, you have you have no one, no kind of real rivals to worry about until the woods in Burnham move physically to Dunsinane, and of course that's what the, that's what the tree in his hand is supposed to represent. So 
this is quite complicated now. So the tree that the child is holding in this image, Macbeth perceives it to mean that 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 represents the trees of Duns of Burnham Wood moving to Dunsling, which of course they can't. So Macbeth misinterprets this apparition as meaning he cannot be touched, he can't be deposed, because it's physically impossible, of course, for a wood to move or wood to, to walk. So he he understands this as meaning that means I have no enemies to worry about. However, again to ruin the play with slightly. Later in the play, and I'll, I'll put a different image up to explain what, I'm, what, I'm, what I mean in a second, but later in the play, Malcolm, who is, of course, the son of, of Duncan, Malcolm, his army is marching from England towards Dunsinane Castle, which is Macbeth's stronghold, his fort, his castle, and on the way they pass Burnham Wood. In order to try and be, to, in, in order to try and go undetected by Macbeth's guards in the watchtower, they decide to each chop down a branch of a tree. In the, in, in the woods and to, to kind of cower behind a branch as they march towards the castle. So in actuality, the woods do, in a, in a way, move towards Dunsinane Castle. So on that basis, we could argue that the apparition here is, again, misunderstood by Macbeth because what it actually represents is Malcolm holding the tree in his hand that he will later chop down. So there are lots of possible meanings to this uh, apparition, but I think the two ones that are, are, are correct are the ones that it represents the, the Stuart dynasty and it represents Malcolm. It certainly does not represent the idea that Macbeth is invulnerable. So Macbeth has once again misunderstood this. Here's the image that I'm referring to as well, just to make sure it's really clear what I mean. Here, here's an image I found from a German cartoon version of Macbeth, but it's the best one I could find for, for showing you what I mean. As you can see, each soldier is holding aloft a branch from a tree from Burnham Wood which is obviously not able to move, so it doesn't physically move, but they're marching, as you can see in the image, they're marching towards Macbeth's castle, and they're using the trees to protect themselves from view. So again, Macbeth has misunderstood this. And let's have a look at his reaction to this, okay? It's really... It's really... So Macbeth, again, he, he's, he's being fooled here. He's being presented as hubristic. Uh, so he says, that will never be. Who can impress the forest and bid the tree and fix his earthbound root? So clearly... Macbeth misinterprets this as meaning that he's immortal or invulnerable and that he cannot be deposed because he says it can never be. The, the forest can never rip itself from its roots, so it can't move. He says sweet bovement's good. And here, this is incredibly ironic, OK, because we know as an audience that these are not sweet bovements, which means these are not sweet uh, premonitions. These are these are these are basically uh, designed to trick him. They're, 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 they're mischievous, they're treacherous, they're betraying him. He then continues, rebellion's head rise never till the wood of Burnham rise. So he personifies rebellion and he's talking about the idea that he could be deposed. He personifies rebellion and says it can never raise its head until the forest raises its head, which he thinks is impossible. So again, he's misunderstood. And our high place that Macbeth shall live the lease of nature, pay his breath to time and mortal custom and it's interesting that he talks about himself in the third person here but what he's expressing is the idea that Macbeth can essentially rest easy and these are sweet omens these are good omens uh, his murders will never come back to his murders will never get come back to get avenge on him he can rest in eternal life uh, internal natural life so it's I think this is for Macbeth a moment of catharsis, of release. He's finally free of his doubts and fears, but it's a very, very short-lived freedom, okay? Because he remembers something, yet, there's a conjunction, yet, my heart throbs to know one thing. Tell me if thou art, if your art can tell so much, shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? So, so far, let's just be really clear. So far, Macbeth has misunderstood all three apparitions. He thinks that he has, let's go through each one. He thinks that uh, he will kill Macduff, that he, and Macduff is not a threat. He thinks that no one can actually kill him, he's a woman born. And he thinks that he will reign until a, a wood physically moves. But he remembers, and these are all good things of course. So it's, these are all things that uh, help him to feel relaxed, help him to feel finally at rest and you know stable. And, but it's very momentary, it's, not, it's very transient, it doesn't last very long because he remembers at. Ah, what about Banquo's children? Remember, that's been the kind of fear and doubt that has plagued him throughout the entire play, the idea that he's going to simply pass on 
his fruitless crown and his barren scepter to Banquo's children. Remember earlier on he says, for Banquo's issue did I file my mind. So for Banquo's children I've corrupted myself. For them, for the, for the children of Banquo, to make them kings. Remember that soliloquy from earlier. Uh, it's for Banquo's children he's done all of, the, all of these terrible acts. Um, so this, this question is plagued him and he asked them, show me if Banquo's children shall ever reign in this kingdom. Okay, so we're going to pause there. Uh, and we're going to pause on that third, uh, I want you to summarise that third apparition and again do exactly what you did for the last two. Take your time, read through your notes and then show me and explain to me your understanding of the third apparition in your own words please. Again, I would take at least 10 minutes to do this. Welcome back. Okay, welcome back. We left off with Macbeth demanding to know if Banquo's children shall ever reign in this kingdom and this links to the final and uh, the fourth and final apparition. So he... The witches firstly, in unison, remember, just to be extra sinister, they say, seek to know no more. Uh, so they're saying, don't ask any more questions. You've, you've received all the knowledge you can get. And Macbeth is, says, I will be satisfied. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. Let me know this. What sinks that cauldron? What noise is this? Because now the final gruesome, and this, this, if I say gruesome, it's not actually a gruesome image, but it's the one, it's the, it's the apparition that will destroy all of Macbeth's hopes and dreams. He, sa he says, I will be satisfied, don't deny me or I'll curse you forever. And then the witches, you know, who again are tricking him, say show, show, show. And then in, in unison they say, show his eyes and grieve his heart, come like shadows, so depart. So essentially show him what he wants to see, but he, it, will, it will cause him to grieve. Because this next apparition is going to destroy all of the security, all of the stability that Macbeth would have felt having received the first three apparitions. And we have our final apparition, here, and I'll just read it out before I show you an image of it. A show of eight kings, the last with a glass in his hand, Banquo's ghost following. Okay, and I, let me just go th and show you the image on and on. on the okay, here we have the third, uh, the fourth, sorry, and final apparition from, uh, that Macbeth experiences. And what I will say straight away is that there's a contrast because the other apparitions, apparitions one, two, and three, all of them had double meanings. All of them were intended to trick Macbeth into thinking that he was secure, into thinking that he would be a long-serving king, into thinking that he was invulnerable to being de deposed and usurped. However, there is no double meaning in this. And it's obvious to the audience, it's obvious to, it's obvious to us now, it's obvious to Macbeth himself that this apparition is, has only one meaning. The, the, it can't be misinterpreted. And it's it's a real. It's an it's it's, it's an apparition that completely uh, destroys his hopes and dreams and his uh, sense of stability, however short-lived that was. The, the apparition is is on your screen. It's a show, a, a demonstration of eight kings, uh, and the last king, as you can see, is holding a glass in its hand. And what this apparition represents, and it cannot be misinterpreted, remember this, it cannot be misinterpreted, it, it has only really one meaning. What it represents is unmistakably Banquo's dynasty that he will found, he will be the founder of this dynasty, hence why Banquo's ghost is following. So he is the founder, the root of this tree of kings, this, 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 this long line of kings, this dynasty. And we've, I've talked a lot about the reference earlier, the allusion earlier to Mark Antony and to Caesar. That makes Macbeth's earlier soliloquy an example of foreshadowing. He, he thought that Banquo, was like, that Banquo was like Octavius Caesar in that he will found an empire and he was like Mark Antony in that he will be the last of his kind. And this apparition proves that to be true. And there's no misunderstanding this one. And Macbeth understands exactly what it means. And it's fascinating because his... His reaction to it is so charged with hatred, with, with anger, with disappointment and with genuine fear. And we'll have a look at his reaction in a second. But what I would say is just remember that this, this, is, this is the one-sided apparition. It can only mean one thing. And of course, this suggests that Macbeth will be deposed. He will be usurped. He will lose his crown uh, and he is not invulnerable. So it completely destroys all the hopes that the other... Um, apparitions have given him and it's obviously an example of trickery because he's been set up with false hope that's now been taken out taken from him essentially the rug has been swept from under his feet is, is the old way of putting it okay so Macbeth says 
Thou art too like the spirit of banquet, down thy crown does sear my eyeballs. And of course, metaphor this is obviously metaphorical, uh, but he's trying to convey the pain and, and agony that he's experiencing at seeing the crown on someone else's head. That's why it sears or burns his eyes, because it's such a horrifying sight to see the thing that he's, uh, you know, the thing that he has uh, pined for and longed for and you know, strove to maintain uh, on someone else's head. He's been, it clearly represents the fact that he will eventually be deposed, okay? Um, he, can, he then realizes that he's been tricked. Filthy hags, he says in an exclamatory sentence. And I would say to a certain extent, this is the, uh, the moment of anonarisis, which is the moment of realization in a Greek tragedy when the character goes from ignorance to knowledge, the main, the tragic hero, because he's realized here, filthy hags. It's, it's almost like he spits those words out because he's realized finally, uh, after four acts, that he has been the puppet of the witches, that he's been deceived by them and misled by them the entire way through the play. Uh, and then his attention goes back and it shifts back to the image of this line of kings, because initially there are eight, but then you notice that one of them is holding a glass, uh, a mirror in its hands. He then says, what, will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? Another, yet a seventh, I'll see no more, and an eighth appears, who bears a glass which shows many more. Okay, I'm just gonna go back to the image that he is looking at to explain this. So you have to remember this is a trick of staging in a sense, because you've got the eight actors who are dressed as kings, one being Banquo's ghost, and one is holding, and he's holding that, that, that glass, that mirror, and the mirror is reflecting in a show of even more kings. So in, reflected in the mirror, the audience would be, would be able to see even more kings stretching out, as Macbeth puts it, until the crack of doom. And he's, again, metaphorically, he means the end of time. So he's saying, is this, you know, this dynasty will last until the end of time. And of course, you can understand the reference to the Stuarts here. And he's saying the Stuart dynasty, uh, well, Shakespeare's hinting at the Stuart dynasty, you know, lasting until the end of time. It's a kind of an example of flattery. Um, he notices, he says, some I see with twofold balls and treble scepters. So they're all decked in the clothing and the ornaments of a king. Uh, and he, again, he, just as he said earlier in, in, a, in two words, in this exclamatory minor sentence, filthy hags, he then says horrible sight, because this sight of glory or the sight of, you know, these glorious and, and, and you know, these glorious kings of Banquo's issue uh, horrify him because it means that he will not found an empire himself. He will not found, found a dynasty. Then he then comes that moment of anonarisis. Now I see it's true. For the blood bolted Banquo smiles on me and points at them for his. So we've got this incredibly symbolic moment where one of the actors who's dressed as Banquo will be pointing at the kings, mockingly smiling at Macbeth and claiming that these are his kings. He is the Augustus Caesar. He is the founder of this dynasty in the same way that uh, Octavius Caesar was the founder of the Roman Empire. And this surely is the moment of Anonarisis where Macbeth goes from ignorance to knowledge. And Macbeth asks, remember he's horrified, he's agonised, he's heartbroken. He asks, is this so? Is this true? Can this be true? He can't believe it. And the witches who, are, who have enjoyed this you know, charade, they've, they've enjoyed mocking him and bringing his hopes up and then crushing them. They say, yes, it's true, but why do you stand amazedly? Come, sisters, cheer we up his spirits and show the best of our delights. I'll chime the air to give a sound. Uh, that this great king may kindly say our duty did as well can pay. And they're mocking him. They describe him as a great king. And we know that he's not a great king. He's, got, he's actually going to have a very short-lived, sorry, I'll turn it for you. He's going to have a short-lived reign. He's going to be deposed. And it's the idea that the witches are mocking him is emphasised in the stage directions of music playing, witches dancing, and then they vanish with Hecat, the goddess of witchcraft. So they're kind of mockingly dancing, mockingly celebrating their success at completely tricking him and fooling him and then it just just it almost is a mirror image of what happens earlier on when Banquo and Macbeth encounter the witches on the barren heath on their way back from battle he says where are they gone let this pernicious hour stand a curse in the calendar come without there uh, and he knows he's been tricked he, he realizes that they've fooled him Lennox the Lord then enters and he I'll, I'll read the scene out very quickly OK, but, but let's have a pause here before Lennox and just summarise uh, the scene from 
the fourth apparition, which is uh, here from seek to know no more, down until come in without there, so down to there. So let's have some time to pause, summarize our understanding of the fourth apparition, and then we'll finish our lesson on Act 1, Scene 4. Okay, so the witches have disappeared, uh, and then we have Lennox entering, and he says, what's your grace as well? He has no idea that Macbeth has just been frequenting with the witches. Uh, Macbeth asks him if he saw the weird witches. He says, no, I didn't. He, he, Macbeth then says, Come they, came they not by you? He said, no, indeed. And Macbeth says, infected be the air upon which they ride and damned all those who trust them. And it's a metaphor. The first line is a metaphor, obviously, for the idea that they are corrupt, that they are toxic, that they're venomous, that they poison things that they touch. The second line is that moment of anonorisis, of realisation. Damned be all those who trust them. He's realised that he's been tricked, that he's been fooled by the supernatural powers, that he is a victim of their uh, machinations. Um, he then asks, you know, why have you come by, what, what, why are you by, coming by horse? And Lennox gives him the news that Macduff, who was of course the subject of all of those apparitions, he was the, he's the person who will uh, behead Macbeth, he's the bloody child, he's the, uh, he will be in the army that, that uh, move the woods from Burnham to Dunsinane and he will be responsible for helping Banquo's child form a line of kings in a sense. Uh, Lennox tells Macbeth that Dun Macduff has fled to England which of course means that he's, he's um, proven his disloyalty so Macduff has essentially uh, abandoned his allegiances to Macbeth. Macbeth repeats the line uh, Lennox says, yes, my good Lord. And then we have a, a short aside from Macbeth, which is full of rage, full of fury, full of anguish. Time, thou anticipates, I'll read it first, then we'll go over it. Time, thou anticipates my dread exploits. The flighty purpose ne'er is overtook, unless the deed go with it. From this moment, the very first things of my heart shall be the first things of my hand. And even now, to crown my thoughts with acts, be it thought and done. The castle of Macduff I will surprise, seize upon Fife, Give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. No more boasting like a fool. This deed I'll do before this purpose call. But no more sight. Where are these gentlemen? Come, bring me where they are. Okay, and he personifies time. And he says that, thou art, that you anticipate my dread exploits. Essentially what he means here is that time is moving too quickly for him to actually uh, carry out the acts that he needs to. So essentially he hasn't got time to commit the number of murders he needs to. Um, he then makes a vow, and it's an important one to remember. He says, from now on, from this moment, the very first things, and the first things like a seed, so the first, or the kind of the early sprouting flower, or sprouting plant, the very first thoughts of my heart shall be the first of my hand. And again, he's speaking in metaphor, but I think it's quite clear what he means by this. He means whatever feeling that I have in my heart, and remember that Macbeth's heart is corrupt, so he only has murderous ones. Whatever murderous feeling I have in my heart, I will carry out my hand. So it's about the idea that he's going to act on impulses. He's not going to hesitate anymore. He's going to kill with impunity. So once again, he's kind of reiterating the fact that he's plead, you know, pledging himself to tyranny. He's pledging himself to committing acts of violence to keep his crown. He's essentially going to fight this. Uh, he's going to fight these apparitions. Even though he's fated to lose, he's going to fight them anyway, uh, which is exactly what the witches wanted him to do. He says, I'm going to crown my thoughts with acts. And again, he reiterates metaphorically this idea that from now on, he will act upon any thought that he has. And again, these thoughts are murderous. Be it thought and done, just to reiterate once again. And then we have this colon, which announces to us his horrible and diabolical next acts. He is going to surprise, which means attack, the castle of Macduff. And of course, he's just found out that Macduff has fled. So this is an act of vengeance. But crucially, it's an act of vengeance on the innocent. He's not planning on attacking the castle of Macduff with Macduff inside. He's not planning on you know, taking out his revenge on Macduff. He's planning on exterminating Macduff's family and anyone that traces in his line. So he's planning on wiping out Macduff's relatives, his family, his children, his wife. It's an it's a, it's a act of brazen tyranny just to reiterate, uh, which once again establishes Macbeth as being a bloody tyrant, and, and it's not the first time. So he's going to seize upon Fife, and he means by he means that that's that's um, 
the castle. That's where Macduff lives. He's going to give to the edge of the sword, and that means obviously you know, ex execute uh, or behead his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. And this phrase is important. It's about the line. You'll notice that legacy, legitimacy, and hereditary ideas are really important to Macbeth, largely because of the idea of passing down the throne to your son. And what Macbeth intends to do here is literally to exterminate the Macduffs as a clan, ex exterminate the family completely. He's going to murder his wife, murder his children, murder his servants. So it's an act of callous cruelty, of, you know, of bloodthirstiness. It's almost, it reminds me a little bit of King Herod from the Bible, uh, the idea of killing every first son. Um, so that's how he's been presented. I would say he's been presented as Herod-like, or like the Pharaoh from the uh, story of, of Exodus. No boasting like a fool, this deed I'll do before this purpose call. And from now on, he says, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to stand around and talk about these things. I'm just going to do them. So once again, just to reiterate, this scene ends on a vow of tyranny, a vow of abuse of power. He's vowing to commit endless acts of violence to try and hold on to power, which is typical of a tyrant. And the last lines, no more sights, no more visions. Where are these gentlemen? Come bring me where they are. And it's interesting that he kind of actually preempts this because he doesn't actually have any more visions in the play. They, they, those, are, those were the last visions. He's not going to trust the supernatural forces anymore. He's breaking off his allegiance that he thought he had with the witches. So it's a huge, huge scene, if you think about it, because initially, you know, before this scene, Macbeth thinks that he's got an allegiance with the witches, that they are his, uh, in some senses, his uh, aides, they've, that they've helped him to the crown. Lady Macbeth certainly thinks that. And by the end of the Act 1, uh, sorry, by the end of Act 4, Scene 1, He's come to the realisation, as has the audience, which well, we, we already knew, but he's come to the realisation that in fact he has been tricked and misguided and misled the entire way through the play. And that now he stands helpless against the forces of fate and death. That he's not invulnerable, that his crown will be taken from him. And that by the end of the scene he is literally you know, trying to hold on to power, try, uh, desperately holding on to power, I would say. I, I would say this, this is a desperate tyrant who's facing being toppled. We remember that there's an army approaching. Okay, that was a lot of information, but we have come to the end of Act 4, Scene 1. So take the time now to summarise the end of the act from where we left off with Enter Lennox down to that last line. Then you have to complete your overall uh, tasks, which are on the whole of Act 4, Scene 1, and pass the quizzes. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I know it's been a longer lesson than usual, but it's such an important scene, as I've, as I've j just you know, explained to you. See you next lesson for Act 4, Scene 2 and the awful storming of Macduff's castle.